we work with families all over the world, but primarily it's the mom that contacts us or, or um, is a customer or um, is seeking coaching. And time and time again, it's how do I bring this to my husband? How do I get my husband to understand what I'm doing? That's not always the case, but that's something that we come up with often. And, and one concern we get is the worry that Waldorf education is not rigorous enough, especially in the realms of math and science. And I thought I'd throw, start this question out to, um, to Jamie and to Jack, um, what their perspective would be on, on that concern. I'll, I'll let you go first, Jack, go ahead. Thank you, Jamie. <laughs> um, well, honestly, I've often had the same uh, concern. I, I like to think that our schools are rigorous in our teaching of history and geography and math and science. But I think rigor is a good thing. When I was trained at uh, the school where I did my graduate work, it was a school where rigor was an important part. But the understanding was that, that rigor is broadly based um, because you want children to be rigorous in what they learn so that they're well educated. Um, you want them to be rigorous in the, the way that they're taught to write because writing is such a fundamental part of uh, expressing your thoughts. But you also want them to be rigorous in how they listen to their teachers and to each other. And you want them to be rigorous in the way in which they do their work, their sense of responsibility. So I like the word rigor. And I like to think that our schools um, should be rigorous. Um, having said that, um, I often think about how do we prepare kids for tomorrow, for the world that we can envision. And that reminds me that we can't give them answers because the answers that we give them probably will not be adequate for the questions that they're going to encounter as young adults and as adults. And so instead you want to give them capacities and those capacities um, have to do with the three basic tenets of Waldorf education, which is educating children to be um, clear, attentive thinkers and to be resilient, emotionally engaged students and to be um, responsible in terms of what they do. And, and those capacities are really what we want to develop rigorously. So I often think about that when I think about, well, how are we doing with math and science? One of the things about Waldorf education, and I don't mean to go on too long, Jamie, is that um, we're really teaching children to think differently. And that's been my takeaway from my years of teaching. And that's been my understanding of what was intended when uh, the Walter schools were started, that we we're gonna educate children to think with their, their whole human intelligence, which means both their analytical, their cognitive intelligence, and also their intuitive, um, emotional, affective intelligence. And so a lot of what we do is we teach through art, and as we'll speak about, I'm sure we'll hear, we teach through story, um, we th teach through interpersonal relationships. We just teach in many different ways to help children have a good sound education. And I just wanted to show, I have a couple of examples of work that my students did in eighth grade, my last class. And it really, I think, doesn't do a bad job of showing the rigor. This was from an anatomy block in eighth grade. And I don't know if you can see this, but here's, it's the vertebrae, the human vertebrae. And, you know, when children draw something with this detail, they know it, they know it deeply. And then they understand um, what they're learning on a deeper level. Here's just one other illustration. But if you know middle school students, you know that getting them to work this carefully doesn't just happen. There has to be a rigor and it's a rigor in what they, what they bring to their lessons. So that's my hope. I, I think Walter schools should be rigorous. I think that they often um, 
aren't known um, enough for their rigor. Those are my thoughts, Jamie. Thank you, Jack. I, yeah, I would agree with everything that you just said. I think I'm going to put a slightly different spin on it, however, and that is oftentimes when I hear these kind of questions, they, they're really questions that come out of a place of fear. And fear plays, I think, a pretty big role in our society. I used to say that long before, you know, we all the, some of the issues that we have uh, in today's world uh, were visible. But yeah, it's um, how much of this is coming out of a place of fear. And then secondly, what do we mean by rigor? What does that really mean? Now, I would agree with Jack that rigor really means a, a, an education that really goes into depth. And in terms of I'm a math teacher, and, and so in terms of mathematics, it means to think deeply. But usually when people don't think of this very, think of the question, what do we mean by, in this case, this question of what is rigor? Uh, if we don't think about that thoroughly, then we actually have, a, I think, quite a misconception because usually what it kind of means is, well, it means that they're kind of ahead. It means that they're kind of winning some sort of competition. And, and I think underneath that is this, this unconscious assumption that somehow the purpose of education is a competition that we need to win. And honestly, I like to think anyway that that Waldorf education is is really rising above that. And I think I, I absolutely believe that we need to get out of that. Now, I, I should say, first of all, that I'm a product of that mindset. You know, and I, I went to a, a decent public school in Connecticut. And to me, the purpose of school was as a competition was to win the competition or, or to do well in it anyway. And so, yeah, I, I learned how to play the game. And, and certainly from the point of view of mathematics, mathematics ended up being some sort of game. The game being, okay, your, your job is to do the homework that you need to do, or at least give the teacher the impression that you've done the homework so that you didn't get a bad homework grade, for instance, and then, and then to pass all these tests. And, and I have to say it wasn't, it wasn't based upon deep thinking. And in fact, to some degree, I was thinking as a student that I was successful at the game if, if I could actually do well on my tests with the minimum amount of effort and perhaps I didn't learn it very deeply at all. And that was totally okay because my test scores were good. And I ended up going to a good engineering school and continued to play that game and be good at the game. And so I like to think that Waldorf education has risen above that. And we're kind of, we're not playing that game in terms of a competition. Now, don't get me wrong. I absolutely believe that our students not only should have a rigorous uh, education, but they should be prepared for whatever, not for whatever comes next in their life. And yes, I want them to be, and we say this often as Waldorf educators, we want them to be prepared for life. And so to, again, to penetrate these questions, what does it mean to be prepared for life? That's a very interesting question that we could have a whole conference and discussion about that. Or let's just say, what does it mean to be prepared for college? Now I've, I've taught for a long time in uh, Waldorf High School here and at Shining Mountain Waldorf School in Boulder, Colorado. And, I've had many students prepared to go off to Ivy League schools, engineering schools, you know, the whole gamut. And, and they were very well prepared. I would say they were better prepared than what their peers were. What do I mean by that? Well, in terms of preparation, I'd have to say that a concern that I've heard voiced often, and you hear this, that for instance, if you talk to somebody who um, is in the world of engineering or, or the tech world and so forth, you'll often hear complaints that the students, that the people coming to them, graduating from college and now starting in their, their company, there's often the complaint that they're not really prepared for what they really need. What do they really need? They need people that can truly problem solve. So the complaint is these people are coming out of engineering schools and they're fine, they're good at, as I was, they're good at solving problems they've seen 50 times before. They're good at solving problems that the teacher told them how to do, that they were essentially blindly given without thinking, just memorize how to do this, take the test and you're okay. But they're not very good at true problem solving. 
they're not very good at thinking of creative solutions. So this leads to another question. Yeah, so in terms of a math teacher, this is what it's all about. It's about, it's about deeply thinking about questions. That's what math and end science should be. And so this next question is, you know, what does it really mean to problem solve? What, 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 what allows one to think creatively about new problems? Because as Jack said, we don't know what the problems are gonna be in the future. We don't know what the big questions are, we're not. We don't really know what society will look like and what questions and that we're going to need to solve. But what allows for someone to solve new problems that they haven't seen the solutions to before, what allows that is the capacity to think creatively. And what allows for that? That's a big question right there. What allows for someone to think creatively? And I would say it's not this race to get ahead. You're not gonna be better at math and science because you've been fed cold, meaningless facts about, I mean, I remember being in sixth grade and knowing you know, an oxygen molecule or an oxygen atom had, I think it's eight electrons, protons, neutrons. I knew all this stuff. I even made a styrofoam model of it, which to be honest, that isn't really what an oxygen atom is, but I was told that. And sure, there are many other scientific facts that I memorized, but I can't say that I was really educated in a way that I could think creatively um, to, at that point in, in, in my life. So, you know, these are questions. And I like to think that Waldorf education, by not engaging in this blind race to just get ahead, but instead to go deeply into subjects and to really, this is what I try to do as a, as a Waldorf math teacher, to get them to take the time, slow down, and to get them to discover for themselves some of the mathematical principles. And it would be true for science and other subjects as well. This idea that education isn't something that we just feed to students and that they just sort of, we just pour it into them. Instead, it should be something that they are an active participant in, in their own development. And this idea to d imagine that discovery should be a huge part of math and science. So let me ask you, in your own education, did you have the good fortune to really experience on a regular basis what it meant and what it felt like to be discovering things for yourself? I know I didn't. And oftentimes people who would look at a program and say, that's rigorous. And it's not really because they're actually not given that opportunity to discover, to create, and to actually experience the essence of what math and true math and science really should and ought to be. I, so. I like that you mentioned fear um, and, and almost a sense of lack that, that people would bring to their thoughts on education as when I worked as an education reporter, and it was this was over 15 years ago when, you know, the No Child Left Behind thing was starting up, and the State Board of Education was throwing out all these different ideas about how to get where they thought they were supposed to be, and I talked to the woman on the phone, and she started rattling off like, our test scores are behind China, our test scores are behind Finland, they're behind Japan, and my first thought was, how do you know they're the same tests that everybody's taking? But there was this hysterics behind it. And then I thought if the hysterics is at the top, at least in the state of Idaho that I was in, then it's coming down to all the teachers and then to the kids, the anxiety, somehow that it mattered whether that a, a kid in China scored better than them on a test. Well, I mean, think of it. What was, when that term was first uh, coined, leave no, no child left behind. I think collectively our entire society or certainly our entire parent body in this country kind of collectively looked at each other and said, oh my God, is my child behind? So immediately it put them in this place of fear, right? And, and that's what it is. It's so fear-based. Our education, our world today is obviously increasingly fear-based and, and this is a concern. And I think we need, you know, we all know that when you're in a place of fear, you don't make good decisions. You can't think clearly. And so this is something also that we need, I think, to talk to parents about. How much of what you're saying right now somehow has an element of fear behind it? And can we get out of that and truly ask, what do you really want for your child? What is really important? What do you think 
a good education really ought to look like? And very few parents, when you really go deeply into that question and ask them, will say, yeah, I just want them to have as much stuff as quickly as possible. And I want them to have lots and lots of homework. Very few parents would ever say that. 